Today's kit was last released before I was even born and was first released before my father was even born. And yet here I am on a beautifully sunny day, getting all excited inside my little man cave over this, the Airfix SRN1 Hovercraft. Now released as part of the Vintage Classics range. Let's dive in. Okay, so we're gonna start by taking a little look at the box. We have this beautiful Roy Cross artwork. It is all explained actually in good Airfix fashion right here on the side. So pause and have a read of that if you want, but it explains that it is a vintage classic and tells you what colors you need and of course has your flying hour. Um, I do like the addition of the vintage classics branding on the standard Airfix box. I do think it really helps. Not much to see on that side and that's what you'll see in the shelf if there's a stack of these things uh fantastic right anyway enough preamble so this is what you get inside we are going to have a little look at the decals first simply because ugh, i really don't want these to get damaged so getting them out of the way as quickly as possible makes sense quite minimal we have some branding we just have the black and white cross checkered things the, the bits which go there look you can see it on the box there the, the bits what go there and then uh, a little badge it says sorrow uh, which is Saunders Row which is what the SR stands for um, very nice I assume although it doesn't state on here that they are cartographed because that's who ethics use moving on to the instructions the first thing I note is that this is presumably the original text that came with the original release as it talks about it being a new type of vehicle, so very much present tense. Again, pause that if you want to have a read. Uh, very interesting. I'll probably go over a brief history at some point, but that is it. Nothing else. This is the new format of instructions, certainly relative to 1950 whatever. So nice and self-explanatory. We will not go over every step of this because we're going to get straight into building it and we'll explain along there as we go. Generally speaking, black and white, although there is some colour here, which I assume is for decal placement, and a wasteful blank page of white on the back. Although turning over, turning over whilst, yes, there is a lot of space, you can see why they've got the blank bit. Oh. Sorry, I just hit my camera. Um, but you can see why there is a blank bit. It's because it's got the assembly structures on it. But there is the colour call out. We have just one option, which, considering it was a single hovercraft, is not really a surprise. It is the SRN1 as per its cross-channel travel. And finally, we have this rather enticing bag of plastic parts. So we're going to cut this open and see what we've got. Well, looking more like something out of an HG Wells novel than something actually crossing the English Channel, we have a flying saucer. Uh, but no, in all seriousness, this is the hovercraft, as you see. It is not the largest kit. It is 172nd scale, but it's a fairly compact tool. And the inside state airfix product 1960 which um interestingly contradicts well it doesn't contradict but here it says the mold was made in 1959 so quite likely yes the mold was not made in 1959 but it was first released in 1960 so they preempted that and put it on the inside there plastic is oh, that's just me just bending a hovercraft oh it's fine it's not 200 quid eBay anymore um plastic is fairly thick standard airfix stuff I say fairly thick, not in a bad way. I mean, it's standard airfix plastic is what I'm trying to say. It's good, it is solid, it's trustworthy. Look, I've just made half the kit. Uh, so we have a top and a bottom. We have a curvy thing here. With some other stuff here. The same on the other side, a curvy bit and a base for the... Other bit. I don't really know anything about hovercraft, clearly, other than big engine, big gas turbine engine makes a cushion go um, go up and it powers itself from there. Science! Uh, but yeah, other bit here, intake, that's presumably for the engine, something in there or in there or whatever. And these two. So rather than a coherent box type gate, which is a modern day practice. This is very typical of Airfix at the time. We've got central runners. We've got two figures. 
propeller blades, intake, some other bits. We've got a couple of seats as well as a base for what I assume are the like the air channels. Is that what you'd call them? Small amount of superstructure. Four little wheels and these uh ooh, look like hammers, look like tools of some sort, don't they? So wait and see what they are. And some more gubbins here. So yes, that is a very quick look of what is inside the box. And finally, even though I'm keeping it inside the bag for safety, we have a very small amount of clear parts. Um, one. Yep, let me just count again. Uh, yep, definitely one. We will have to wait and see how... Ooh, ooh, I was going to say how crisp that is, but looking through the bag, it looks beautiful. So yes, one clear part, four assorted jumbled sprue parts, and a hull top and hull bottom. So this was very much a surprise addition to the FX Vintage Classics range. It was released, well, within a few days of it being announced. I think that is fantastic. Uh, it is ridiculous, and I love it very much. I will include a screenshot of the Scalemates history of this kit. However, there are discrepancies between the dates listed here and on Scalemates, so by all means take it as a reference point, but I would just take it with a pinch of English Channel Sea Salt rather than as gospel. Already mentioned that the date here is different to the date on the inside of the tool, which is fine. But also, for example, the artwork date is listed as 1965, which is different to how it is on Scalemates. So, before we get too engrossed in the construction of this kit, just a very quick reminder that I'd be very appreciative if you could subscribe if you don't already, hit the like button if you want to, notification bell if you're really that way inclined. Either way, thank you very much if you can. Now, on to the main event. Construction for this kit will be more or less as per the instructions, save for a few modular variations just to make my life easier. However, we do start off with the upper and lower hull, and this, what I assume is a sort of engine mounting nozzle thing. Um, doesn't make sense, you know what I mean. I, it, it's a hovercraft, I've never made one before. Uh, either way, it gets glued into the bottom of the hull, and then the top of the hull goes on top. Now. All of these parts have a few things in common. Firstly, there is a little bit of flash, and secondly, there is a little bit of annoyance when it comes to the plastic feed, those uh, feed marks. That is particularly true of the hull, where you have these ribs all the way around the side, which I assume were to somehow support the air cushion. Uh, it's a bit of a pain, you have to get a, a small file in there to really get rid of them, but nothing that I can't handle, it's just an observation. Don't forget, this is a very old kit. It's not exactly up to today's standards. We come to parts four and five, which are listed on the original instructions. Should have mentioned that. I've actually got a copy of the original 1960 instructions up because it tells you what all the parts are. And therefore, given that I don't know much about hovercraft, a little bit more of an understanding. But it counts them as induct. Um, induct towers induct uh, let me you know what I said I've got it in front of me and I'm not even looking at it what an amateur right they are intake ducts oh god it's really hard to say intake ducts uh, that's what I'm just gluing here they are parts four and five spoilers they come back to kick me in the backside but hey like I say spoilers um, I aligned them, they were a little bit tricky to get in, but I aligned them with the lower propulsion ducts. There we go, that's what the uh, the long bits on the side are, they're the propulsion ducts and these are the intake ducts. Uh, but I cut them, uh, all of those parts off together to align them to make sure that they fit. They do need to be snug, that is the main intake duct part, is the big domey thing that you see on the top. Um, but all of those were cut and prepared, as I say, just to try and get them to fit nicely. Now here, the holes on the upper hull were not quite in line, so I had to open those up, and I also, on one side, removed the locating pin. Essentially, if you make it as per uh, the, the holes and the pins, you end up with a little bowing effect. Uh, there is no way around that, from what I can see. You either have to open up the hole to adjust or get the, um, the, the locating pin removed. Uh, after that, whilst they're clamped together and the whole thing is drying, we have the front 
this is presumably the front of the hull. It's a different material uh, on the real thing. Obviously, the model's the same thing, but it's it's clearly a different texture. It's made to look like a different part. And I had great difficulty getting the top and lower half together. It turns out there is a really annoying bit of flash right there that had to be cut. Um, I did mention that all the parts had flash. There was nothing severe, nothing that stopped construction other than that bit. Uh, and because I was a bit slow, I hadn't worked out that that's why the two halves were not going together. But it's only a little bit of flash. It's not difficult to remove. So trim it off with a knife, as you saw, glue the two bits together, and afterwards go over them with a, a knife and some sandpaper just to smooth that gap before the entire front can then be stuck onto the main hull. The reference I made to the modular construction is actually to do with the colours. You note that there are really three colours that this will be. It's uh, silver, white and blue. The idea was to assemble the hull, spray it silver, assemble all the bits that needed to be white, spray them white, and then paint the remaining parts which were blue. And so actually, in hindsight, I would not fix the lower propulsion ducts. Ugh, so I'm really struggling to remember what they're called now. I would not glue those onto the main hull. I would actually have sprayed it before that point. However, to get the intake ducts to fit nicely, you kind of need to have the lower ducts on. But anyway, it worked out all, all right in the end. I primed anything that was going to be either white or silver with this Citadel's thing. It's just a white primer. It's just what I had available. I usually use Tamiya primer. However, I ran out and I had this. But whole thing, given a quick blitzing of that before a quick blitzing of mica silver uh, from Tamiya. Again, this is just an aerosol. The reason for this particular shade of silver is very, very simple. It was the only silver aerosol they had in the shop. See, sometimes... I mean, it's just a silver, right? It's just a silver? Surely it's not that big an issue. Anyway, top, bottom of the hull, all sprayed that. Oh, but why didn't you airbrush it, you may ask? Well, that is a good question, and I could give you a good answer, but I'm not going to. I just felt like it, all right? It's an old kit. I can't be bothered. Anyway, uh, I got some Tamiya Gloss Whiteout, and this is where the first notable mistake that you'll see at the end really comes in. I was too close there. That white ruined the induct. Induct? It's not even a thing, the intake duct uh, and the propellers a little bit it uh, is not a great paint i should have been better but anyway tamiya xf8 matte blue is the blue that i've decided to apply onto the propulsion ducts um the instructions say number 14 french blue which is quite a light blue i had some reference photos uh from from the time it's a little bit tricky because they faded over the years this is a vehicle from the late 1950s so it's a bit difficult to pinpoint the exact shade of blue it would have been. Yes, the real thing is preserved, but I can't find any photos of the real thing in its current form. So uh, it's the best that I could do of the blues that I could find. And I quite liked that shade of blue. And I still stand by this shade of blue being very, very nice. And having checked, it's actually called a fan, not a propeller. That was placed in here and it is held in without any glue at all. The whole assembly just kind of snugly fits into the uh, the base for the intake ducts and I think looks rather smart. Now, we're going to go back in time. Okay, so I've just noticed an error in the instructions and I've double checked to make sure that it's definitely an error with the instructions and not with myself because that would be embarrassing, wouldn't it? Right, so, oh, apologies. We have step two, which I've already done. Parts, oh, I've just put a hovercraft on the instructions. We have part four here, and we have part five here, right? Part five, port, part four, starboard. We know it's port and starboard because this is the front, because that's the part of the main hull stroke cushion thing that is missing. So here is the front, this is where the cab goes, part five on this side, part four on this side. However, one of these parts has a hole. And it's supposed to be this part here. But instead it's this part here. So this is the exhaust hole, from what I gather. It looks like an exhaust. It goes back that way. And it should be on the port side, which is shown in the next instruction step here. Right, part 19 into this hole just behind the cab. Cab bridge whatever it is you know the control bit right so here's the uh, the the 
cab, the bridge, the uh, steery bit, and the hole should be here. So how do I know that this is part five and this is part four and I've done it as per the instructions? Well, thankfully, because it's an old kit, it has a lot of the parts, part numbers mentioned on the actual part itself. And that there says four and that there says five. So I put part five where it tells me to put part five and part four where it tells me to put part four. And now I have a hole where there shouldn't be and no hole for the exhaust. Also interesting to note that the original instructions that I've downloaded from when the kit came out in, what, 1960, does have the exact same error, meaning this error has been consistently in the instructions for, what, 63 years. So yes, good going. Nobody's proofread that or made any changes to that, have they? Ah, oh dear. Anyway, we're now getting on to the sort of final assembly and the sundry. So here we have what I believe is a fuel tank, according to the instructions. There is also an oil tank and an oil cooler that go on the back. The instructions say to paint them all silver stroke chrome, so I suppose you could actually assemble them and put them on before spraying the entire hull. That would make some sort of sense. I didn't do that. Um, if I made another one, which I don't know why I would, because there was only ever one in real life. But anyway, if I did make another one, that is perhaps what I would do. As a slight aside, don't you hate it when you're in the middle of making a model and then your light array decides it no longer wants to produce light and suddenly you're in darkness? Anyway, uh, light's fixed temporarily and I'm painting the seats. Now the instructions just say to paint this silver. Um, from pictures, there's obviously some sort of covering. I chose a leather colour, which is a simple combination of a Vallejo Leather Brown 70.871 mixed with a couple of other colours like a cream and an orange and not fully mixed, so you can just kind of pick up different tones. It is a really, really lazy way of doing uh, fabric. You should really base it with a cream and then you can dry brush over it. This is 170 second scale. These seats are the size of my fingertip. It really doesn't matter, but it just gives you an impression. And then there's the other um, control equipment, cab equipment, bridge equipment um, that are here as well. One of the holes, which is for the, I'm going to say driver, stroke pilot, stroke captain seat, which is this one here on the left, the hole has completely gone. Um, you could probably open it up from the inside, but from the outside, I could not see where the hole was. Rather than open up a new hole, drilling out a new hole, what I actually decided to do was just cut the pin off the seat and place it down like that. The cab struts can then be assembled using the cab roof as a guideline, and then everything just kind of falls together with the propulsion ducts going on top. Um, also, another quick aside, I did actually give the blue one more coat just to blend the top and the bottom half in a little bit, which I didn't show on camera, didn't think it was worth it, but uh, just just to, to mention that I did that. Also, these little, um, what are they called? Gate valves, apparently, that you can see there on the inside of the propulsion ducts. I painted them before gluing them in, but as you can see, one of them doesn't have any paint. It's because they're upside down. At least two of them are upside down and two of them are not, as far as I can tell. I positioned them in the logical way, all four of them, and they just never seemed to work out right. There was always something that was wrong. So, in the end, um, I just glued them in and painted them afterwards if they needed it. There is a single clear part which is glued onto the base that was then hand painted. It wasn't masked or anything. It's a nice, very clear, crisp bit of glazing and uh, it's just easy to run a paint slightly at an angle across it and that is fine. The things that I referred to earlier as hammers are in fact fire extinguishers. So I painted them red as instructed and then picked out any bits in black that needed to be such as the instrument panel, the control columns, and at that point things like the tyres were also done. Finally then we move on to the decals. Now I had great difficulty with these ones, which is the registration on the hull, and it's just because of the shape of the hull. It's convex, it's got loads of raised ribs on it, and it's one long decal. One of the falls did actually break, however I think I masked it fairly well. It's just a bit of a pain. I don't really see a way around it, but at least these cartograph decals are pretty good quality. In fact, they're very good quality and thus went on very well. The same as all of the rest of them, but it's a bit samey to show you all the decaling, so I'm not going to. 
things like the control rudders. I suppose you've got front rudders and back rudders. Uh, these are the rear rudders, you can tell, because they've got big yellow things. I sprayed the yellow as well. It was just a Tamiya yellow I had, just didn't show it on camera. And then the only time the airbrush was brought out for this was the satin varnish, which is the Vallejo 70.522 that I use for most things, but very rarely show. Well, I say most things. If it's meant to have a gloss or satin finish, it's what I use. No problems here. Finally, then, we're just gluing on the fire extinguishers and the cab to finish the model. So, I guess... We just need to have a little look and final review of the Airfix Vintage Classic SRN1. Uh, I am aware that I have jumped ahead slightly with the narration, but it's fine. I just wanted to raise your awareness to the yellow, which you're going to see on the final reveal. I did slightly mess it up, and I am... Well, before we go to the final reveal, I do just want to have a quick shout-out to the channel members. If you can join them, please do. If you want to join them, of course. If you don't, that is absolutely fine, but they do offer the channel some support, and I'm very appreciative. Right, that aside, going straight to the point, let's not hide anything. This is a very old tool. This is from 1960 or 1959, depending on which bit of the kit you want to read. And as such, you're not going to have as fun an experience as perhaps a brand new tool from any of the main companies. However, Airfix have made that very clear. They've put it in the Vintage Classics range, and they deserve a round of applause for doing exactly that. Did I have fun with this build? Yes. I did rush it somewhat, I'm accepting that, and there are some problems with it. So, the yellow. I slightly messed up the yellow, as I said. I put clamps on the yellow section when I was putting the decals on, and the clamps left a mark. That has not been removed. The white is not the best white for it, and I definitely did not do a very good job of spraying that. And the fit in a couple of places I could also have done better. It could be said that I was rushing slightly, and that is absolutely true. I was. I was getting very excited over the prospect of making this. Despite all of that, despite some of the frustrations, such as having to re-drill a hole for the exhaust, and I'd already sprayed, so I didn't really mask the, uh, the fake hole very well, this was £10.99, and it is something very different. If you want to just have fun with a kit that is something totally different to what you normally make. If you build planes, great, it's kind of a plane-ish. If you build ships, cool, it's kind of a ship. It's more of a ship than a plane, but it's kind of that. If you like cars, then great, it's sort of a car that goes on water and floats a little bit. It's just fun. I like this, and I'm going to give it a rating, because I keep forgetting about my rating system. But here it is, Airfix, for your Vintage Classics SRN1, I give you a... My hovercraft is full of eels out of 10. There we go. So, thank you for watching. Stay tuned for some more content generally every week. Subscribe if you haven't already. Like if you want to do that thing. And notification bell if you want to be disturbed about your daily routine by me. But until then, let me know what you think in the comments below. Are you interested in buying this? And what silly things do you think Airfix should release next? Until next time.